Hello everyone and welcome back to the St. Clement Catechetical Institute's course on the First Communion Catechism for Teens and Adults. I'm the founder of SCCI and your instructor for this course, Kyle Copey. And remember, this is a free course, but if you want to take the course for a certificate, please visit our website, sccinstitute.net, and log into our Google Classroom. This is all free. Watch all the videos, complete all the quizzes for this course, and you'll get your certificate. Again, this is a free course, but if you would find it in your heart to support us with prayer, especially, uh, or if you have the means to support us monetarily, all the information is in the show notes. Now, this is our last lesson for this course, lesson 12. We'll start with a review of lesson 11 from last time. And then we'll get into our last lesson, Lesson 12. But before we do so, let's turn to page 5 in our First Communion Catechism, the New St. Joseph's Version, and let's pray the act of faith to prepare us. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My God, I believe all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches, because you have made them known. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, Lesson 11 talked about the Holy Eucharist. Sort of the entire point of this course, preparing people to receive the Eucharist. And there's a couple basic things that it wants you to remember. Number one, our Lord started this sacrament, the Last Supper was the first mass and he gave this power to his apostles and to the bishops and priests after them to continue this sacrament on so that they could make or what we call confect the holy eucharist and distribute it to faithful catholics throughout the ages and they do this at mass they do this the priests and bishops through what's called a special prayer known as the consecration and uh, the priest or bishop will say a special prayer over the, the bread, and it actually changes into the Holy Eucharist. And so does the, the wine change into the precious blood of our Lord. And it wants the first communicant to understand that this is truly our Lord, that even though these things, after they're consecrated by the priest, appear to be bread and still appear to be wine, they're in fact not. They're changed into our Lord himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Now, not anyone can just walk up or should walk up and receive Holy Communion. You should be a Catholic in a state of grace, meaning you've confessed all your mortal sins in the sacrament of confession. You should have paid attentively at Mass, prepared yourself mentally and spiritually and physically to receive Holy Communion. How would you prepare yourself physically? Well, you'd respect the laws of the church that say currently that you need to be fasting for one hour at least before receiving the Holy Eucharist. And all this is done to respect our Lord and to receive all the grace that he wants us to give. After you receive communion, go back to your pew, kneel down, and say an act of thanksgiving and ask God for all the graces that you need and uh, the grace for others that uh, they need as well. Okay. Uh, technically in this book, it ends at lesson 11. That was the lesson 11 review. But there's a lot of supplemental information that I want to talk about, and I'm calling this lesson 12. And this gets into the Holy Mass specifically. Beautiful picture there of our Lord at the altar. And when we see the priest at Mass, we know that he's in what we call persona Christi, is in the person of Christ, offering himself to his Father on our behalf. So the Mass is, at, is Christ's act of love towards us, and our Lord faces two ways at Mass. So depending on what type of Mass you go to, uh, the priest might be facing away from you. He might be facing the same direction as you, towards the tabern tabernacle. Sometimes throughout the Mass, or at certain points of the Mass, the priest will turn and face the congregation. 
But our Lord faces two ways at Mass. He looks up to heaven and he gives himself to the Father on our behalf. And we're supposed to imitate the priest. We're supposed to offer ourselves to the Father as well, along with the priest. And he also looks at us. The priest looks at us, Jesus looks at us, and he gives us the Holy Eucharist. And that's the food and drink of our souls. The next page, some things we might see at Mass, usually around the altar. There's a lot of different things we might see at Mass. Number one, the altar itself. I mean, it looks very much like a table. In table, in, uh, in liturgy, were the traditional places of sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they used to sacrifice animals on an altar. Different religions, pagan religions, would do this as well. They would sacrifice other things. Uh, usually they'd be pretty brutal and, and nasty, and that's why we don't do those in, in the one true faith, the Catholic Church. But God knows. But the, the reason why they developed is to get human beings were made with something in us by God that told us that we need to sacrifice. And that's why we had sacrifices in the pagan religions. And that's why we had sacrifices in the Old Testament of animals. But none of those could make the ultimate sacrifice. It had to take... God coming to earth in the form in, in our Lord in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ to make the ultimate sacrifice on the altar of the cross. So we have the altar there. It looks like a table. Mass is said on it. It is a very holy object. Depending on what church you go to, the altar might be separated from the tabernacle, or the tabernacle might be right behind or above the altar. If you see an altar that's separated from a tabernacle, uh, simply bow to it as a sign of respect. Obviously, if the tabernacle is right behind it, genuflect to our Lord's presence in the tabernacle. Number two, cruets. These little containers uh, containing the, wa the, the wine and the water to be used at Mass. and They're brought up during a time we call the preparation of the gifts. Number three, the chalice is the golden cup that holds our Lord's precious blood. Number four, the ciborium also looks like a cup with a lid on it, and it holds the hosts that the people receive at Mass. And this is how the priest carries it around, and he takes each host out and distributes it to the communicants. Number five, the monstrance. It is a, a shrine, and it sits on top of the altar, and our Lord's body can be placed in it it's got a circular glass window in which you can place a piece of the Holy Eucharist in it, one host, and everyone can see it. And it's protected, and everyone can adore our Lord. Number six, the tabernacle. I mentioned this earlier. And the tabernacle is a, a golden box. Sometimes it's veiled. And tabernacle literally means tent. You know, we think back to the Old Testament where... We had the tent of meeting of Moses, where he used to go and talk to God. And this is very similar, because we place the extra hosts, the consecrated hosts, in that golden box called the tabernacle, and he resides there for us to come to adore him. Now, we can't see it, because he's in the box, uh, but sometimes if there's the, the red lamp next to it, the lamp of presence, it's a, a red vial with a candle in it, it burns red. We know our Lord is present in there. So we can genuflect to him and spend some time with him. Number seven, the crucifix. So the crucifix is a unique type of cross. Our Lord hung on the cross. When someone is on the cross, especially our Lord, we call it a crucifix. It's a cross with our Lord on it. And he reminds us that he died for us. And he loved us very much in order to do that. Number eight is called a paten. A paten is a plate, a golden plate, that holds the bread to be consecrated by the priests. And you notice how all these things are golden. Uh, it's a law of the church that these things, these holy objects, the most sacred objects, the Eucharist, must be placed on precious metals like gold. Number nine is a missile, not the type of that's a weapon that's used in war, a different type of missile, M-I-S-S-A-L. And it's a big prayer book, and it has all the prayers of the Mass in it. It sits on the altar, usually on a stand. Number 10. Lastly, we have the candles. 
They remind us of our Lord. They are made of pure wax, and they burn like his sacred heart. Okay, now let's go through the Holy Mass step by step. The first thing you see is the priest at the foot of the altar. So the priest begins Mass in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, makes the sign of the cross, and then we uh, tell God we're sorry. We say what's called the, the confiteor, or the I confess. And we all, as a congregation, confess our sins to God. Not singularly. We don't all confess, confess specific sins, but we all tell God through this prayer that we have sinned and that we are sorry for it and we need God's grace. Then the priests will go to, uh, he'll say some, some other opening prayers, and he'll go to the, the missal and say the, the liturgy of the word. So we're, we're thanking God, we're adoring God, and we're thanking and we're asking him to enlighten our minds so that we can understand what he wants to teach us. So that's the whole first part of the Mass. We have the introductory prayers. If it's a Sunday, we might sing uh, the Gloria. And then we hear scripture readings at Mass. Depending on what Mass you go to, there might be two or three readings from maybe the Old Testament, the Pauline epistles, the letters of Paul, and then the Gospel, which the priest or deacon will read. And then we will hear a homily as well. The priest offers bread and wine. Okay, now we get to the second part of the Mass, which is called the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And the priest is preparing everything. He prepares the bread. The wine is in the chalice, and he offers it to God. And we, we want to please God in offering ourselves to him. And then we have the most important part of the Mass. We mentioned before the consecration of the host. And the priest bends low over the bread because it's a very sacred act. He's using Christ's words to change the bread into the Eucharist. So he's being very careful when he does this. He's speaking the words of Christ. Christ is speaking through him to the priest's piece of bread to consecrate it, to change it. Everyone should be kneeling in silence at this time. And the priest says the words of Christ, This is my body. And then the bread is changed into Christ's body. And here we're asking God to change our hearts, just like he used the priest to change the bread into himself and to change our hearts so much so that they're filled with love for him. And then you'll see the priest raising up the hosts, what we call the elevation of the hosts for all to see. And he genuflects and, and he raises the host for all to see and then we adore Jesus. And a good thing to say, and you might hear bells at this time, depending on if, you're, if your parish does this, it's a good practice to do. At the elevation of the host, bells are ringing, three bells. And we should look up and adore our Lord, and we could say something like, My Lord and my God. And this is echoing the uh, words of St. Thomas, Doubting Thomas, in the New Testament, when he finally realizes that the Lord is truly risen, and he says, he acknowledges that my Lord and my God has risen. But the consecrations are not over because we still have to consecrate the wine. So the priest consecrates the chalice. He bends low. Remember, it's a very sacred act. And he speaks the words directly to the wine, the words of Christ. And it changes the wine into Jesus himself, into Christ's precious blood. It reminds us that he spilled that blood on the cross for us and that all of this is part of one act of love on God, his sacrifice and him giving himself to us. Just like the host, the chalice is elevated. The priest will hold it up. Three bells should ring again. The priests, and then we are to look up and adore the precious blood. And we can say something like, my Jesus, mercy. Because we remember the great act of Christ spilling his blood to give us forgiveness, to give us mercy. After the consecration, we will together say, Our Father, because these are the words that our Lord gave us to pray. And then we have the communion reception. So the priest will receive the Eucharist himself first, and he'll drink the precious blood. 
And then, depending on how your parish does this, some parishes offer offer the the chalice, the wine, to to the entire congregation. Uh, that can cause many of its own problems. It's very hard sometimes to avoid spilling and you know people drinking out of the same cup. Um, it's not quite sanitary, even though it is Christ's precious blood. Uh, the the accidents, the appearances of wine still remain. So it's it's more highly recommended that the people only receive the bread, the host, um, which Christ is present in. Because if you receive the host, you're getting the entire Jesus. You don't need the wine. So the priest receives the host, he drinks the precious blood, and the people receive the bread of life. As you're receiving it, you're asking the Lord to make you worthy, to take away all of your, your power to sin. Even though you're still going to be tempted, he can help you not to sin again and to make you strong and to lead you to everlasting life. Now, you can break the Mass up into many, many other different parts, and there's a lot to talk about, but that's the basics of the Mass. And what are you supposed to do after Mass? Mass is great, but it's meant to recharge your batteries and to send you out into the world holy and sanctified and ready to live your faith. So how do we live the Mass? Well, we must live our Mass every day. And we must be willing to love and suffer as Jesus did. Jesus loves and continues to love everyone. And we must, even though it's hard, we're still called to love everyone as well. And the Mass can help us do that. It can help us love as Jesus loves. We see a picture there of you know, two boys walking down the sidewalk, seeing a new boy in the neighborhood, saying, you know, we're glad that this, that this new boy moved in. Let's go make friends with him. So the Mass teaches us to love, but it also teaches us to suffer well, because we'll all suffer in this life in various ways, some more, some less. Depending on various points in your life, you might be going through a lot of suffering, um, or you might be going through a little bit of suffering, some intense suffering and some minor suffering. It's just what we're all going to experience. How does the Mass teach us to suffer well? Well, remember, Jesus suffered for us, and we must be willing to suffer for him. Suffering means, essentially this, be willing to go to do or to go through something that's uncomfortable, that we don't like doing, or that's painful. And the Mass helps us to suffer with Jesus. And suffering is not things we bring upon ourselves. They're things we have to deal with. Sometimes we, we might have to force ourselves to do something, but sometimes something might be forced upon us, like an illness. And the question is, how do we suffer well through that illness with the power from the Mass? So we see our two mothers talking in the living room. And one mother expresses her joy that her daughter, Jane, goes up to bed right when she's told she doesn't complain. Even though she doesn't want to go, even when you know, she wants to stay up and watch a cartoon or play with some toys or something, she's obedient to her mother. She suffers well being told to do something that she really doesn't want to do. Mass is done every day. There are weekday masses, there are, and then there's the Mass on Sunday. And you can go to Mass every day if you want and receive Holy Communion. And we know this because we have something called the liturgical calendar. It talks about the different feast days throughout the year. The church at various times throughout the year celebrates certain aspects or moments in the life of Jesus, or Our Lady, or the saints, special celebrations in the church. The two biggest feast days of the year are Easter Sunday, the day where our Lord resurrected from the dead, and then Pentecost Sunday. Uh, shortly, this is about 50 days after the resurrection, our Lord tells them, right before he ascends back to his heavenly Father, he tells the apostles who are gathered around him, go back to Jerusalem and wait there until you receive the Holy Spirit. So that was 40 days after he resurrected, he ascends into heaven, and then 10 days after that, Pentecost happens. Pentecost means 50 so 50 days after the resurrection. 
Pentecost is the start of the mission of the church. It finally emboldens the disciples to commit to the mission of the church and never turn back. And they go off and preach to the ends of the earth, spread the faith everywhere, and most of them are martyred. They're killed for spreading the gospel. We have a handful of what we call holy days of obligation. So we're obligated to go to Mass every single Sunday. Do not miss Mass on purpose. But there are some other important feasts of the church in which we're supposed to go to Mass. Number one would be December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady. It reminds us that Our Lady was made, her body and soul were made immaculate by God. They were made without sin. Our Lady never fell into sin like uh, we did in terms of original sin. She wasn't born with it. She wasn't conceived with it. She never had any personal sin. And she didn't do this on her own. God made her that way to prepare her to bear her son, or to prepare uh, to bear his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the womb of Mary. Christmas, December 25th, it's our Lord's birthday, the day in which our Lord came into this world. Remember, he had already been alive for about nine months in the, in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary after the Annunciation. And this was, this was his birthday. This is where he was born into the world outside. And he uh, entered for the first time outside the womb of the Blessed Virgin. The octave of Christmas, the octave day of Christmas, which is January 1st, the day when our Lord receives his precious name. Remember, this, is, this name is extremely powerful in the Jewish tradition. This is where, uh, you know, the child would be circumcised and receives his name. The Ascension, 40 days after the resurrection, so 40 days after Easter is when our Lord rose up back to heaven. And remember, 10 days after that, Pentecost Sunday would happen. The Assumption on August 15th, the Assumption of Our Lady, she was taken up into heaven because she was immaculately conceived. She had no original sin. She had no personal sin. And so our Lord chose to take her body and soul into heaven. There is no grave of Our Lady on earth. And then lastly, on November 1st, we have All Saints Day, the day where we thank God for all the saints in heaven, all the saints who are praying for us and who we hope to join in the future in our heavenly homeland. So remember, these holy days of obligation mean that you are obligated to go to Mass, even if they fall on a weekday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You're supposed to go to Mass on Sunday, but if, these, if one of these days falls on a weekday, then you're obliged to go to Mass on that day. And usually parishes will offer multiple Masses, whether in the morning or evening, so you can fulfill that obligation. Okay, wrapping up here, there are various prayers um, in the end of the, towards the end of the book here, blessing before meals, acts of contrition, which we went over, uh, the confiteor, which we say at mass to help our Lord to know collectively that we're sorry for our sins, the Apostles' Creed, which is very important, prayer, especially if you're trying to memorize the Holy Rosary. We say uh, a longer form of the Creed at mass. It's called the Nicene Creed, but they're the very, very similar. The Apostles' Creed is the shortened, more summarized version. And then on the back cover, we have the Ten Commandments. It's important to have your child remember and memorize the Ten Commandments. Uh, take them chunks at a time. And also, too, in terms of memorization, the seven sacraments. All of those things are important for your child to memorize before their first communion. Your parish, depending on how they prepare children, might have them memorize and, and, uh, and be quizzed on those elements of the faith. And our back cover here, um, there we go, uh, we'll end with uh, this prayer as we end this course. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like your heart. Mary, Mother of God, show yourself a mother to me. St. Joseph, protector of the Holy Family, protect me in all dangers. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you all for joining me on this course. And if, you're a, if you are a First communicant, communicant, I wish you the best and a joyous First Communion. 
and hope uh, and hopefully many more joyous communions to come as you'll be receiving our Lord for the first time. And if you've already made your first communion, hopefully you've learned uh, a bit more about your faith from this course. We invite you to look at some of our other course offerings on sccinstitute.net and we look forward to joining you in a future course. Thank you and God bless you.